Okay, I think we can begin with our new edition of the current topics in Heritage Science Lecture Series. So hello, my name is Tiasha Riavets and I am one of the organizers of this lecture series alongside Fabiana Di Giambincenzo from University of Ljubljana and alongside our colleagues Diego Quintero Balbas and Antonina Chaban from the um, National Institute of Optics uh, in the Center for National Research in Florence. And as part of this lecture series, we'll be listening to nine experts that will present their research focusing on the fundamental aspects of heritage science, including the methodology, the technology, the techniques, the materials that are used in cultural heritage, as, long, as well as discussions on technical and ethical issues in the field. These lectures are targeted at young professionals, emerging, emerging professionals, uh, students, young researchers, uh, curators, restorers, and basically everyone interested in heritage science, so all the relevant stakeholders. And the primary aim of each of the lecture is to give the audience all the tools to understand the topic and also have the literature available to independently learn more about the topic so that they can eventually also apply it in their own research. We do hope you will also join us in future lectures and you can find more details about the lecture series on our website. Uh, I do want to say that all the lectures are recorded and will be also available later on uh, the ERIS YouTube channel. Um, for, our, um, for our attendees online, please use the Q&A function already during the lecture to write in your questions, uh, but uh, the session will, but the, the the answers will be uh, later moderated at the end of the lecture by the speaker. Uh, but if you do experience any technical difficulties, let us know through the chat. And this series will start with Professor Dr. Piotr Targowski, who is a physicist by background. He's a professor of optics at the Institute of Physics at the Nikolaus Copernicus University in Turun in Poland. His present scientific interest focuses on non-invasive examination of artworks, especially with optical coherence tomography, X-ray fluorescence, and X-ray diffraction techniques. He is the president of the Polish Node of Eries, and his lecture today is titled Optical Coherence Tomography for Examination of Artworks. So, Professor Dragowski, thank you for being with us today, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Tasha. It is my great pleasure to be here with you and inaugurate this new edition. And thanks again for the very harmful uh, invitation. And let's uh, start. This is about, uh, will be about optical coherence tomography, which is an optical technique for answering one of the most critical questions which we very often ad, uh, ask, which is what is the structure of the object? What is under the surface of the object of, of heritage? And of course, we would like to answer this question non-invasively. The simplest way would be to take a sample, but if it is not allowed or we can avoid it, it's always better to do it non-invasively. And let me just explain with a simple example. This is what we usually see looking at just to focus our, our uh, discussion further on something practical. Let's say this is a painting, but could be also anything else. So we can see it from the front like this or the same way. Uh, and now what we are really want to know is the structure. So what is the order and structure of the layers of this, of this object? And what we would like to do is to do a virtual cross-section which could be then uh, analyzed uh, as a separate image or combined into a set of such a cross sections to get more information about the internal structure of the object. And one of the tools which can answer this is indeed optical coherence tomography. I'm sorry, I did something wrong. Okay. And this is example of, the, of the, such a, a result from OCT. And I will explain it a little bit more precise later, but generally we have a cross-section here. So this is, let's say, air above the painting. This is the 
surface of the painting, then we see clearly two layers of varnish, some glazes and a paint layer below. We can measure this thickness of these layers. Also, I would like to point your attention to this scale bar here, which shows us that this image is, of course, uh, stretched in this vertical direction to three times. And the area we sense here is a few millimeters, so it's much, much bigger than usually we can do with a sampling of obvious reasons, which is additional advantage of OCT. Okay, so what is OCT? This is the major application and where actually OCT was invented for is the ophthalmology. Here you have a, one of instruments, a commercial instruments which you can find in uh, hospitals, in some uh, ambulatories, just to examine the human retina. This is another instrument and this is a kind of result what doctors see and the most important are these two pictures on the bottom which are just a cross section through the retina. Obviously non obtained non-invasively and these the other are more advanced uh, analysis of this data but uh, most important is that the primary result is just a cross section. And let me now uh, just say a few words how it works. Will we just only one slide here. So this is a technique which actually measures the time of propagation of light to the object with extremely high precision due to the effect of interference. This was for the first time used in similar experiments by Albert Abraham Michelson, who was the first Nobel Prize winner for the United States. And he was born actually on the territory of Poland in 19th century and then uh, his family emigrated to uh, United States and he was a professor with, uh, in Pasadena, California. Okay, so the crucial is the light source, which is a broadband or multicolor, if you like to say, light. And if this is, some light is emitted from this source, it goes, bounce from the object, bounce from this reference mirror, and nothing happens. But, so we have no signal, but if we move this reference mirror to the same distance as something inside the object like now, if now these uh, two lights, they meet and interfere and we have a signal from the detector. And this technique was used for examination of eye by and invented as a special tool for ophthalmology in about the year 2000 by Professor James Fujimoto from MIT, and the name of the technique is indeed optical coherence tomography. Sometimes we just use abbreviation OCT. Okay? And that's it about the theory. Uh, now, maybe a few words how to read images. This is a similar image to this one I showed you before. So, again, here we have air. This is the surface of, in this case, it is again a painting. Here is one layer of varnish may be a little bit pigmented because it scatters a little bit of light which we see by this uh, little uh, blue blue hue here. Then is a second layer of completely transparent varnish and a paint layer. Okay, and what is important here is that these colors you see here, they are not a real colors of the object. We use so-called false color technique which we code with color the intensity of scattering. So since the most of scattering occurs at the surface, for some re physical reasons which are not important at this moment, but we have to remember that this is the most scattering always the, 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 and reflecting the surface. So we have this warm uh, yellow and red colors and when lights, uh, light goes inside, we have less intensive scatter, so we have this blue, uh, blue hue here. And as you can see, we have here two different structures. We have these narrow lines and we have this thing here. So this is kind of general K uh, to uh, understand these pictures. Usually what is this most uh, scattering is air varnish interface like here and so on. But of course this could be different for different objects. Generally the more, more 
warm color, a higher scattering. And we have to actually, from this, deduct the uh, properties of the object. We don't have any information about the real color of the structures, apart from some specific situation which I'll come in a moment. So, okay, but what is this here? Why we have this, this tails? Okay, so the more simple situation is if we have this thin line, and this is when light scatters one, I mean comes, scatters here, and is collected by, by the instrument which is here above the, the object. But if we have multiple scattering, which means light goes inside and scatters many times before it will come back, and as I said, what the instrument does, it actually measures the time, so it doesn't know that we have this path here. He thinks that this is something like that. So he reports points which are actually closer, very close here to the surface, as something laying deeper. So these things are usually an indication of high scattering properties of the of the material. Here we have two examples. This is cobalt blue. Cobalt blue is very scattering material, so we have this, this taste like in this, this example. But Prussian blue, which is of sim quite similar color, is highly absorbing, so we don't have this effect. We only have, we only register photons which are directly scattered at the surface. Whatever goes inside is consumed by the absorption, so we don't have any signal apart from this one, which comes directly from the surface of the, of the paint. So these are these two possibilities, which sometimes may help us to distinguish between two uh, different uh, pigments, but this is quite a rare situation. Generally, to take home is that OCT is not providing the information about the chemical structure of the, of the material. Uh, so let me just show very short piece of movie how it works. Here we have a machine, this is the head object, and as you can see, there are some cables going to the computer, and so just take a look. So what we do, we just have to put it close to the object, not very close, this distance is about four centimeters, so it's far away, we don't have any danger of, of uh, touching the object, of course, and by programming, the, we have to program the, the, the experiment. And what is most important here, which I don't know, you know I, no, I can't because I now have a new pointer. Okay, so in a moment you will see the, this is the, this is what I would like to show you, that the result, which is this cross sections, are immediate. So we don't have to wait for processing. The, now the computers are fast enough to give us immediate answer. And here you have seen the, uh, place where this examination was performed, also precisely. And also we can move a bit our head to find most important and interesting spot, and this was just a recording here. And it's recorded. That's it. Next point. So this is very fast, this technique has a few seconds to get uh, actually a recorded, recorded data. So to take home about the system, what we have. As I said, this is optical, non-invasive system, and large few, few of, field of view up even to 15 millimeters by 15 millimeters, which gives us a very good uh, average information about the object. We are not, uh, we not, must have not be uh, only drawing conclusion about very small and sometimes completely uh, random place of taking samples. Then we can use different light. Usually it is infrared. There are technically and commercially available three kinds of instruments working from 900 nanometers, which is just a little bit uh, after the uh, red light, and a little bit longer wavelengths. But the problem is that the longer wavelengths, we have better penetration of light through the object, but much worse resolution, in-depth resolution. So if you really want to resolve precisely very thin layers, let's say of varnish, like here, we have to use this modality working at 900 
this actually this instrument I'll show you, and the, all the results I will be showing uh, in a moment, they are coming from this system, which of course has a lowest penetration. I mean, the penetration of light or the thickness we can imagine is similar like what we actually see. So whatever is visible in the visible light, so we, whatever creates the visible uh, impression of the object, this is also uh, available for measurement with OCT, but not too much deeper. Uh, resolution, lateral, I mean, in the in plane of the, of the object is about, as I see to here, is about 15, uh, 10 to 15 micrometers, so it's a little bit lower than in depth or actual resolution, this one, but this is the most important because this gives us a thickness of layers. These are the details of the structure. As I say, it's not contact, and it's quite pretty fast. Getting a volume data about three-dimensional structure of object like 15 by 15 by say two, two millimeters cube, it takes 10 to 15 seconds. But of course, what we can imagine here are at least semi-transparent structure. We have to get, a, have to have a structure which is available for light. So if we have an opaque paint, the only we can have is a surface of this paint. And generally, these instruments are commercially available, uh, but built usually for some industrial purposes for control of technological processes and things like that. This instrument, I am, uh, this result I'm showing was built in my laboratory, especially for uh, ultra heritage. Uh, examination and uh, within this one of these projects which been uh, uh, which been, uh, what do you say precedence of IPER and IHS this was Charisma a project also of European Union okay so about results now we can use OCT for two uh, general purposes structure examination and real-time monitoring of procedures here you have a list of different uh, this different kinds of objects we can we can examine. Of course, we will have no time to go through all of them. Let me just concentrate in the first part of my presentation on paintings. So we will have this sequence and uh, thickness of varnish and glaze layers, and also on monitoring of some, let's say, cleaning procedures, both chemical and by laser ablation. We can use this, this exemplary uh, application of OCT. Okay, so again, this is the typical result. And what we have here, this is, you recognize the, the object, of course, but what is interesting, what we can, what kind of conclusion we can draw from OCT here is about this multi-structure of varnish. We have two varnishes here and separated by some a semi-transparent layer, uh, which was as it came from more extended examinations, which was added by Restore at a certain moment. And also this area is interesting because this is a protrusion caused by uh, lead soap formatted inside the uh, paint layer here. But I want to point your attention here to this line, which means that this crater which we can see better down here, is actually filled up with varnish. This means that this process of formation of lead soaps is already finished. So we don't have here more danger to the object because this happens a long time ago and now the structure of the paint layer is stable. This was very important conclusion for the restorers from Van Hoek Museum for uh, planning the next uh, processes, next, perhaps next restoration uh, attempts to this, to this painting. Uh, this is another example. This is a, a very beautiful painting from a uh, workshop of Leonardo da Vinci. And interesting thing is that we just got only, I don't remember, about one hour access to this painting, and we were able to 
measure it so many points. So this is just to give you an impression how fast this technique is. And let me just show a few examples of results. This is the, this first one just shows the, the varnish, very thick varnish on top of the paint layer. But the next one, which is this one, for instance, we have also these structures here and similar for the other points, which are actually over paintings done during some uh, former restorations. But what is important at this moment is that we can clearly show to the restorer that A, we have a very thick and clear varnish below the overpainting. So if somebody would like to remove this overpainting, we can do it safely for the, for the object because you still have this protecting layer of varnish. And this actually was done, this varnish removal, before this famous Leonardo exhibition in Paris just before the pandemic. And the second important uh, information is that there's a plenty of paint layer below. So obviously this uh, restoration was, I mean, pretty, I would say, not professional from the modern point of view because it was definitely over painting of, on existing paint layers, which of course uh, was fixed by, by uh, present uh, uh, process. And this is the same painting, but slightly different way of presentation. We can do also a cross section now in parallel. Before I am showing you the cross section, which will be perpendicular to the to the painting. Here it's in parallel, and this shows the structure on the surface of the painting. Nothing really interesting in this case. But if we go deeper, now at 28 microns below the surface, you see this overpainted structures. If we go deeper, we see something quite surprising because this looks like a, a canvas, which of course, it's not possible because, as I told you, uh, OCT is not transparent. It, it means the, the object is not transparent for OCT to actually see the canvas, which is supposed to be here. But this is just a kind of repetition of this structure, which was insist in the paint layer during a process of uh, lining. And below this is a real structure of, of paint of the of the object. There are some other things, but I have no time to go, because as a matter of fact, this, this canvas doesn't exist anymore. This was removed. So we just only can judge about it by this trace of not existing canvas in this painting. So it is some way to trace former restoration processes at this object. Here is another example. This is a, uh, this reliquary, which was uh, presented by Cardinal Bessarion to the uh, monk, and generally to, to Venice, uh, as a gift because his, uh, his uh, emperor, John Palogolos from uh, the Constantinople, he sent him to beg for help against Turks. He didn't succeed, but the reliquary is still in Venice. And this painting is just the moment when he, this is Bessarion, actually is offering this to these two monks from, from a scholar de la Academia in Venice. Okay, uh, so what we've been uh, working, we're working on this painting uh, uh, structures here. And the first thing I want to show you here is again this parallel cross sections. The first one is just a crackles here, these little cracks here, at this level. Then if you go down, we see this one. These are some internal cracks in the very thick layer of olifa. Excuse me. Uh, due to the uh, uh, exposition to sun. And below is a paint layer. So this was, again, the hint for the restorer that this process which is visible on, uh, on, the, on this uh, paint, but uh, this is again located inside the varnish, not related at all with the original paint layer. 
Another situation is regarding this uh, gold uh, drawing here. And this is how it looks like at this level and a little bit below. Now we have this one. This is repetition of this. This strong signal comes from, from gold, of course. But if we go deeper and even deeper, we see something, some traces of similar gold below. And what this tells us, this is a, a evidence of the restoration which was actually commissioned by Bessarion before he decided to give this reliquary to, to Venice to, to, as a gift. So they removed this, I don't know, 14th, 15th century restorers, they removed this, all this olifa and repeat this work here. So make it, but of course they didn't do super precise jobs. So like they didn't really much super precisely, but so due to this, we actually can see traces of this previous one. So again, we can trace here some far, far uh, before us the first, some restorers of <laughs> almost medieval, medieval times. Uh, another will be about monitoring. So this is example when we work together with two techniques. This is OCT of FTIR. And so FTIR is, uh, this was not our group, was a group of Costanza Miliani from Siena. And so what we do in such a situation, we first of all, we do FTIR. So we have a image, then we do OCT. We're getting our OCT cross-section, then some conservation, some attempt to remove the varnish in this kind with the swabbing was done. Then we do again OCT. As you can see, the image is slightly different because we see the some varnish removed. And again, FTIR after this process is now different because this signal from this original uh, varnish is not present here. So this permits for precise determination of the composition of both varnish and the paint layer before. And here you see the map of the amount of varnish removed. So we can say that this, during this process, we removed about 10 to 20 micrometers of, of varnish. This, is, this is information was uh, also obtained from OCT. Okay, there are some other examples of using different, uh, on different painting of different uh, solvents. And as you can see here, we have different results and you can precisely trace the applicability of given procedure to this specific uh, painting where here we have partial removal, here we have total removal, here we have some very unhomogeneous removal, which of course is not a, a desirable result. Okay, and this is about another combination of those two techniques. We have this painting, uh, which was first analyzed with uh, macro XRF, and we have this scan where this is lead, this is barium and zinc, and we have a lot of structures painted with barium and zinc, which of course was not uh, compatible with the date of, uh, of painting. So uh, we had to check if this is, uh, original thing or something added. And again, with OCT, we can scan it here. You see we have this specific line. It's this one and it's visible here. This is not, this does not belong to the original paint layer. It is something added after. So obviously, again, we are tracing some uh, renovation attempts here with modern, modern uh, pigments, which are nothing to do with the original structure, so may, must not be taken account for uh, dating of this, of this object, okay? So I'm just showing this, this is the kind of selective paintings we did just to show you that OCT can be used for many other paintings of different times from medieval down up to completely modern ones and uh, for all of them, some information was possible to be uh, withdrawn. And let me now 
skip to another uh, very quickly now because I'm slowly running out of time, I think. It will be about glass. Glass is convenient because glass is transparent. So we don't have to worry about the absorption, but there are some other <laughs> problems as usual. But this is one of the examples where we just have a, this piece of bottle from excavation in Wrocław. Uh, in Poland, and we see here very precisely some delaminations of the structure of, of uh, this. So this is the surface of glass. Glass is down here. Of course, it's thicker than our uh, range of examination, but we precisely can say what is the state of preservation, that we have a lot of delaminations here, because this black line inside tells us that this glass in this this place is completely delaminated and we may expect uh, some flakings. This is another problem. This is about corrosion of historic glass. Corrosion means that the components of glass metals like sodium, for instance, or other been washed out by presence of moisture and what left is just a sponge of silica gel. And this gel layer is possible again to be uh, examined with OCT. Here we have also some voids, so already the process of destruction is very advanced because we, this was just flakes here, they are gone. But below this, we have the structure of, of uh, silica gel, but because of multi scattering, we cannot really say anything about the thickness of this, because this is, these are these multi-scattering tails I've been, talking, I've been showing you before. However, what we can do now, we can examine the same glass from the other side, and then we see very sharply the boundary between this healthy glass and this uh, corroded one. And of course, we don't see anything further here because of the same reason, but by combining these two uh, these two images, we can say what's happening at surface and simultaneously what, how deep this process is. This comes from the church in, in Krakow, Basilica, very known Basilica in Krakow. Uh, no, this is the surface of, of, the, of the glass here. Okay, and this one is uh, another example. This was also examined through glass of this collage, which was just a paper photography or print glued to the glass surface, but the glue was too strong and it caused some cracks, some cracking of, of the glass. And if we do this OCT scan, so you can see sequence of cross sections, the, we see a lot of things going on, but the, uh, I would say interpretation is quite difficult, but by some advanced mathematics, we can just create this 3D model showing the surface of glass. Glass is all above. We can take it visually, of course, and we have this here identified this loose pieces, loose pieces of, of, of glass, and this yellow is glue, which this characteristic structures caused by too strong adhesion. And another example, this is so-called reverse painting on glass, where the problem was again the loss of adhesion between glass and this the paint. This are places like here where we have this very strong signal. These are just completely delaminated uh, structures. Also, we have some uh, traces of consolidation here. This is the, uh, I would say, legend for this and uh, the, the description of this image. So we have a consolidant, we have some think not transparent, so this is nothing here because it's completely absorbing, and some some blisters like in this area. Okay, so again, this helps to uh, uh, I would say properly describe the state of preservation. Of course, it's, this technique cannot be used for restoration, but at least it gives the information what is a real situation here and. If you look at this through the glass from the front, this is very difficult to actually say where these blisters precisely are. And finally, this is the last one. We have a, a, some example which comes from our university museum. Certain time we got on loan 
this pastels by Mela Mutter, he was a painter, a Polish painter in the beginning of the uh, 20th century. And uh, the problem was, is, is it possible that the glass and the, the pastel actually uh, is in contact with glass? Because if so, this is very bad for the pastel because uh, it will migrate to the glass and it is no way to reverse this process. So we have to be sure just to tell the owner, this is a private collection, what is the situation and we will not allow to open. So we did OCT with this and this is how it looks like. This is a paint, this is glass, so we have a gap, okay? And similarly here, this is this area. We have even bigger gap. And again, one more. So the answer is, it's fine. It's no point to open it. It is still a separation, so this uh, framing may uh, stay as it is. Okay, and that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. And these are some people which helped me to work with me from my university. And I'm just mentioning here only a teams of people. It's no chance to say, mention everybody, just groups which are working with me. And thank you very much for your attention. And this is a painter and this is us. Just to finish with it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Piotr. I think that was a really excellent presentation on this very non-destructive technique, and I think those are really the kind that um, are that idealize the the way that we approach studying artworks. Um, so, really, thank you for that. Um, with that, I would just like to advise our attendees online to please write their question in the Q&A uh, function of the Zoom. Uh -huh. oh, okay. And in the meanwhile, I would just like to announce the future lectures in this uh, edition of the current topics in heritage science lecture series. So we have a lecture, we have eight more lectures planned, each of them occurring on the fourth Thursday of the month, uh, starting at 3 p.m. Um, and of course, you will be informed about them if you um, uh, if you uh, register to our emailing list. But you can already preview the topics and our excellent speakers. So, yeah. okay. and I would like to also announce the next lecture, which is going to be happening on the 30th of November, starting at 3 p.m. It's going to be a lecture by Dante Abate on the artificial intelligence in the loop, enhancing cultural property protection activities through intelligent methods.